Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this month's IQ Academy webinar. Thank you for taking the time out to join us on our bite sized session this month, where we'll be taking a look at ISO 45001 with Wayne Darwin of Tarmac. If you have any questions on today's session, you can send these through on the questions panel to the right of your screen. If we don't get a chance to cover any of these, we'll ensure that they're addressed in the follow up materials after the event. Um, we'll also have a short questionnaire that will be displayed at the end of the session today. Please take the time to complete this if you have a chance, if your feedback helps to uh, keep these relevant to your needs. Our upcoming webinar for next month takes a look at workplace communications with Dave Moss of Wingman Limited. To register or find out more information on this, please visit the events page on the IQ website, and the address for that is just on the bottom of the screen now. Our branches are also running a number of events over the coming months. Details are available on the current slide. For further information, please contact your local branch secretaries and their contact details are available on the branches page of the IQ website. And I'll now hand you over to Wayne. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wayne Darwin. I'm the uh, HSC Assurance and Governance Manager for Tarmac. I'm part of a small group that's currently working within Tarmac to manage the migration from the OSAS 18001 standard to ISO 45001. And I've really been invited to come and talk to you a little bit today about our experience, but also I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the background of 45001. And actually, from an MPA perspective and our MPA members, whether actually it's the right thing to do, it, it may not suit everybody as a, as a standard. So what I'm going to cover today, I'm going to kick off talking a little bit about the global toll and, and also the benefits of health and safety management. Talk a little bit about the standard and, and the various different elements within the standard. I'm also going to talk a little bit about some views and perspectives that have, that have come to light in particular from, from Irish and the HSC. Give you a little bit of perspective around Tarmac in terms of our experience and our learning so far. And, and then uh, just bring that to a closure in terms of a, a key summary. So if we think about global toll and backdrop, 2.3 million people killed by work-related accidents and disease globally. 6,300 deaths per day, which equates to one every 15 seconds. 317 million non-fatal work-related accidents. And 160 million people affected by occupational disease, which if you put that in monetary terms, equates to 4% of the world GDP associated with work-related accidents and diseases. So there are obviously some notable benefits of, of health and safety management, um, improved productivity and profitability for companies, the effects of reduced absenteeism and reduced injuries and illness. That's likely to impact on an improvement in loyalty and morale from an employee perspective, but also that can, can have an impact, a positive impact in terms of reputation and obviously an organisational's resilience to, to, uh, to safety and to change. So what and why? So to summarise a lengthy explanation, what follows is, is an ISO 45001 in a nutshell. So it's the world's, world's first occupational health and safety standard launched to cover all countries. For those in the UK, ISO 45001 follows on from 18001 as the standard to achieve. And ISO 45001 has been launched to assist organisations in providing a safe and healthy workplace for all our employees and, and others, prevent deaths and work-related injury and ill health, provide a framework to manage risk, complete, increase employee involvement in health and safety, continue to improve occupational health and safety performance, and the new ISO 45001 standard is one of many standards that is based upon the new ISO shared high level structure, which is also known as Annex SL. So again, what and why? A new standard is needed because although 18001 is well used, 90,000 certifications in 120, 127 countries. It's not a truly international consensus-based standard. So in, in essence, it's not aligned with the other ISO management systems. So what does ISO 45001 aim to do? Ultimately, minimise risk of harm, provide a platform for, for continual improvement, and look to integrate health and safety processes where possible. So if we think about the main characteristics of ISO 45001, it's fundamentally based on the plan, do, check, act model. But what that also introduces is a risk-based approach. And as I've already mentioned, the Annex SL consideration. It also looks to standardise a number of the clauses. So those clauses mapped out in the other, other international standards. So typically we've got the scope, normative references and terms and definitions. But if we look in greater detail at some of the other clauses, we think about context of the organisation, the standard asks you to think more about your interested parties, how you may be impacted by external factors, and also the needs and expectations of anybody potentially affected by your, your organisation and operation. It also looks in greater depth at leadership and, importantly, worker participation, 
ask organisations to think about the commitment they have, the roles and responsibilities they have in place, and also the policy that's been set by the leadership within the business. Ask you to think about planning, how you set objectives, how you communicate those objectives, and what actions you take to bring about those objectives you set. Also ask you to look at support, how you resource your business, and how you resource occupational health and safety. The levels of competence you have in the business, what level of awareness you've got around health and safety, and ultimately what communication channels you've got established. If you think about the operational control, it now starts to ask you to look at how you outsource and how you manage outsourcing and services. And also from a procurement point of view, what provisions you've got in place to manage your procurement channels, management of contractors, and how you manage your emergency preparedness. As you would expect, performance evaluation, you've set all these objectives and targets, you need to determine how you're performing as a business, so ask you to look more in depth at measurement, monitoring, audit, the management review processes, and more fundamentally, improvement and how you drive your, your health and safety performance forward. That can be visualised in terms of the context of the organisation and the management model that sits within ISO 45001. I think this, this, this image sets out really how, how those processes all come together. So as we've said, the plan, do, check, act model is very much central, centred to that, that process with leadership and worker participation centre to, to those requirements. Internal and external issues and needs and expectations feed into those processes and feed into the planning processes. And ultimately, all of those go into delivering uh, the intended outcomes of the management system through a driven model of improvement. So as I've said, it aligns very much now to the other standards, um, very much based on Annex SL, which is the high level structure that implements a common framework to all management systems. In essence, it applies a common language across the standards. This helps to keep consistency, support alignment of different management systems. So, for example, 9001 in quality and 14001 for environmental management. And organisations can find it easy to incorporate their occupational health and safety management systems into their core business processes and get more involvement from senior management, which is key. The standards are written in such a way that by following clause by clause, a modern and methodical approach can be achieved. That said, there are a number of significant differences between 45,001 and 18,001. If we think about context of organisation, there must be consideration of wider issues such as the supply chain, local community as well as cultural, social, political and legal issues, and other factors such as technology, the economic climate and also the governance environment in which you operate. In terms of leadership, Top management, so top management will mean those who control and direct the organisation and set the expectations and define the policy. They need to take an, account, take an active role, set the direction, foster a level of trust, promote positive culture, communicate what needs to be done, and also stress why it's important that those things are achieved. If we look at documented information, we now are in a digital age, um, more reference to electronic equipment and less emphasis on processing information use of smartphones and tablets. The standard doesn't specifically reference the documentation records and documented procedures. There's greater focus on worker participation. Top management need to ensure that more managerial participation is achieved and that they support leadership and, contrib and obtain contribution from others. And if we think about continuing improvement, there's a requirement for continuing improvement objectives and processes throughout everything within the system. As we start to look at hierarchy of control, there's an emphasis on applying the hierarchy of control at the planning and operational stages. So not necessarily dealing with the outcomes, but also trying to design out risk issues at an earlier stage in the process. From a risk management perspective, this requires ongoing assessment of risks and opportunities, both for occupational health and safety, but also for the management system itself. If we think about compliance status, this requires a process to ensure that relevant legal and other requirements are taken into account and kept up to date and compliance status is checked. So in essence, that requires you to have an in-depth legal register that ensures you keep up to date with the requirements set on the business. From a contractor's procurement and outsourcing perspective, it's important to recognise that there have been areas of growth in these areas. Businesses rely heavily on, to an extent, on outsourcing. There's a requirement for specific processes to safely manage these issues. In effect, this extends the management system as far into the supply chain as the organisation has any control and influence. And from a performance evaluation perspective, this requires criteria against which evaluation takes place for not only for occupational health and safety performance to be evaluated, but also in the efficacy of the system in place. 
Another key area to consider, uh, which has been introduced with the 45,001 study, is the concept of opportunity. So it's not just risk, it's also thinking about opportunity. So the standard requires you to demonstrate your business is identifying, assessing and monitoring health and safety risks, but also opportunities. I think it's fair to say businesses generally identify risks fairly well. ISO 45001 brings in perspective the consideration of opportunity. One way to look at this is to consider all risks as potential opportunities. And the example I've given there is if you think of equipment failure as a risk, one way of addressing that would be to see improved preventative maintenance regimes as an opportunity. Another way to consider these types of things is to, to identify the potential risks and opportunities a business faces and address them accordingly. So typically things like business risk of fatality, lost time injuries, serious injuries, major injuries, slips, trips, falls, non-treatment incidents, near hits, unsafe acts conditions are all prevalent in a business on a day-to-day -day basis. But then if you think about the types of opportunities that businesses potentially could factor in, the opportunities presented by new technologies, training, training employees and, and training for those impacted by the business. The findings resulting from audits and also risk assessment activity. The potential that, that the outcomes from whistleblowing and, and the potential that, that the actions can be taken to, to address issues identified within a business. Also, the impact from wellbeing and initiatives that are delivered within a business based around wellbeing. And also the gap analyses undertaken around the different standards and, 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 and requirements. So if we think a little bit about the transition timeline, for those already involved in the transition to 45,001 from 18,001, the clock's already ticking. The new standard came in in March 2018 with an expectation that the migration will be achieved by March 21. Now, we know this isn't applicable to first-time certifications. For any company looking to go straight in at 45,001, the timescales are there. So it's very much down to working to a timescale along with your, your assessment body. So why would you do it? Why would you go down the 45,001 route? If you think about the perceived benefits and the proposed benefits of certification to 45,001, it's perceived to position your business in the top percentage of industry. It seemed to set, set you aside from companies that don't hold certification. There's, always re there's also reference to increasing trust and driving a level of social and corporate responsibility. There's also the suggestion that the consistency driven through having the standard means you'll be more efficient with your business processes. It may well impact on your insurance premiums. Less incidents, less risk of potential claims um, is likely to have an impact. There's also the impact of improved personal safety risk, as well as the, the reduction in, in organisational safety risk. It should improve your managerial oversight. It should give you greater insight from a leadership perspective as to how safety is being managed within your business and give you the line of sight down to the workforce. Very much driven around a preventative risk and hazard assessment process, designing out risk at an earlier stage as opposed to waiting for the incidents to happen. All of that should help with in terms of increased return on investment and drive a more occupational focus on process, not just health, safety and welfare. And, and again, as I've alluded to, think about risk and opportunity holistically, not just risk. To bring about this change, to bring about a transition to 45,001, you also need to think about the training requirements that you may or may not need within the business. In order to successfully deliver certification, you need to consider both competency and training for both employees, but also those involved in auditing and maintaining the system. Typically, those considerations could include lead audit training or internal audit training, which is typically run over five or two days. Costs can vary, but what that does do, it gives you an ability to plan, execute and report on the management system performance once that training is in place. Other training may include awareness or implemented courses uh, and migration training, generally delivered over one day. Again, costs can vary, very much focused around embedding, uh, raising awareness and assisting with the transition from 18,001 to 45,001. Other considerations, the businesses undergoing transition may be necessary to understand the changes between 18 and 45,001 and to brief your operational sites accordingly. You also need to think about who's going to brief the leadership on their responsibilities and make sure that those accountabilities and responsibilities are understood. An important point for me, I think, is to remember for businesses with offices, remember to think about all those involved in health and safety and the management of contractors in particular, so that could include ensuring that you include facilities managers in those briefings and awareness sessions as well. The Institute of Safety and Health, IOSH, have done some studies recently, and they've recently published some, some material in some of their some of their journals and magazines, but uh, they pulled together what they felt were five key steps to assist with the transition and certification to 45,001. Point one, secure top management buy-in and explain how it can manage risk, improve, improve morale, 
reliability and reputation and productivity within the business. Two, review current arrangements and identify your gaps. Three, develop a plan. Ensure you've got a robust plan that identifies and addresses those gaps. Four, examine and embed mechanisms for change. Consult and participation. Consult with your employees. These elements are essential to ensure, ensure and sustain that improvement. And five, actually, once you've identified those gaps, address those confidence gaps and resource the plan effectively. IOS also took the time to, to gain a number of testimonies and recently published those in, in Irish magazine. And they took the time to speak to some early adopters, people that were involved um, from March 18 in terms of early certification to the new standard. One of those was the British Geological Society. And I've, I've, I've took some, some of their key, the key points, really. Their view implementation was a positive experience. At times, the terminology was a challenge and they felt that the ISO 45000 standard was more strategic than compared with the 18001 standard. But what they did need to do was consistently study the standard and the clauses. I guess a key point there is around don't overcomplicate procedures. Make sure your top level manual represents what you actually do as a business. And fundamentally, remember the importance of worker participation in all of these processes. Another key company they, they referenced and spoke to, CVRE Workplace Solutions, they felt the standard bridged the gap between good practice and encouraged a refocus on, on occupational health and safety processes. They felt they were already considering risk and opportunity, so found this more straightforward to consider. But what they did say was the standard place they focused on how effective work consultation and participation have been. What I've done there is I've provided a link to, to those specific early doors views. There's also a number of, a number of other companies that, that were referenced and quoted in there. So details of those reflections can be found at that, that web address. Another key, key perspective, key view, which really sets out considerations in terms of where the company should proceed with 45001 was that of the HSC. And the HSC have given their perspective on ISO 45001 and the exact text and reference to 45001 again can be found at the HEC website, the address given. In summary, they felt implementing may help to comply with the law, but remember, it goes over and above in a number of places. If you already have a management system, it may be easier to adopt 45001. However, businesses with less formal processes may find it difficult to interpret and gauge what their requirements should be. The HEC will continue to rely on a range of evidence. Certification to 45001 is not sufficient to demonstrate you're legally compliant. Another key element was to think that other models and systems, such as HSD G65, may be more suitable to smaller companies and to companies where they don't have the level of processes in place. Another interesting element is to think about whether you apply the principles of ISO 45001, but don't go down the certification route. Importantly, they stress the importance of seeking help to assess whether it's right for you. But remember, management of the system is your responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's important just to pause there and, and, and to re-emphasise that point. ISO 45001 is an internationally recognised standard, but it might not be right for everybody. There are other alternatives. You know, HSG 65, well-established standard, focuses very much on management of business risk and managing for health and safety, emphasises the importance of leadership and management and worker involvement, also focuses heavily on risk profiling and legal compliance and the competence within the business. And breaks that down very much around the plan, do, check, act uh, model, which emphasises policy, planning, as I've said, risk profiling, organisational control, implementing plans, measuring performance, focus on investigation of accidents, incidents and nearnesses, reviewing your performance, and importantly, learning from those lessons as well. So it, it's another option to look at for businesses. As I've already alluded to, another consideration would be actually do everything that 45001 requires you to do, but don't certify 45001. As we said earlier, 45001 is about minimising the risk of harm, providing a platform for continuing improvement, and also integrating health and safety processes. You would still want to achieve these aims, whether you have certification or not, so there's nothing stopping businesses working to the requirements or similar without necessarily needing full, full certification, so it could be an option for some. Okay, so kicking off the processes, remember the three key steps. Clearly understand the requirements within the standard, identify and address your gaps, and use your certification body. Work with your certification body to achieve certification. So if you think about making it happen in summary, organisations need to use the time to understand the requirements and fill any gaps. For organisations already certified to 18,001 and seeking to migrate to 45, the certification orders would probably already have been in touch to discuss the timelines for transition and have probably suggested a gap analysis to identify any necessary changes to existing processes. 
Organisations without certification will need to engage a certification body to audit them and conduct a gap analysis against the requirements in 45001. This will identify specifically where and how an organisation's process needs to be improved to achieve the standard. And of course, organisations can choose to adopt the standard and follow the guidance without seeking certification if they choose to do so, relying entirely on audit, internal audits to determine performance against the process. I think it's important to remember that effective health and safety risk management is the aim and certification is not an end to itself, but it's part of that continuing improvement journey. So if we think about specifically Tarmac and our experience so far, as I said earlier on, we're, you know, we're part way through this process of transition to 45,001. Some of the key learns for us and the key points for us is make sure you've established a project team. Make sure you know who's going to be involved in that and define your scope. Determine up front what parts of the business, if, if you've got different areas of the business and um, broken down into business units, ensure you understand who will be involved in that scope and who will be assessed. Make sure you've got clear roles and responsibilities. It's important everybody knows what part they've got to play. A key point there, engage your leadership up front. They need to be involved at all the stages. It's not just about having leadership at the BSI audit or, or LRQA or any other assessment or any other company you may be using. It's important you engage your leadership up front. Develop an effective communications plan. Make sure you've got communications at regular intervals to keep the business up to date as to what's happening. And remember to include other functional stakeholders. Given the standard references, the need to focus now on training and procurement processes and HR processes, it's important you involve those functional stakeholders in that engagement. And set realistic timescales. Be ambitious and smart, but don't be unrealistic. Don't set timescales you know you cannot deliver or achieve. Think about your assessment route. Generally, there are a number of assessment routes to certification. Um, our preference was to go down the progressive transition route across the staged number of visits, with 18,001 visits being replaced with assessments of the new standard. This can generally take longer to achieve, but it allows for a progressive transition. There are other options. Other options and considerations could be a one-off type hit, where your assessment body would come in and assess you against 45,001 alongside existing 18,001 assessment visits. What I would say is this can be potentially confusing to operational sites and obviously can place a great demand on business and operational sites. I think a key point there is establish your budget. Know what it's going to cost you and establish your budget at an early stage and monitor those costs, in particular when you start to factor in the costs associated with training. So in summary on that, ISO 45001 presents many opportunities but requires a significant investment of the business in terms of time, financial commitment and a significant change in leadership outlook. Standard requires a leadership-driven commitment through delivery of the occupational health and maintenance safety management system. Delivery cannot be achieved on desktop alone. You've got to apply the principle of the PDCA, and these are critical throughout the organisation. The business should consider if it's right for them, and if so, who's going to lead it and how? Ask yourself what you're already doing. Many of the current processes will be adequate to meet the requirements of the standard. Review where your gaps are and address those first and foremost and ensure you collaborate with your assessment body and assessment company. They'll want you to achieve certification and work with them and use your readiness reviews and assessment findings as opportunities. Remember the concept of opportunity. Look for ways to improve your system for the better. What I've done is I've set out there a number of different information sources and references to information that I've used throughout that. In particular, the ISO website sets out the basis of the ISO management standard also provides information around different approaches that companies can use for looking to certify. The Irish website specifically around the ISO 45001 resources and also the specific piece of text provided by the HSC around the management and introduction of 45001. As I've said, I'm not here to represent any specific assessment body, so what I've done is provided a link there to UCAS, who provide a directory of organisations that are accredited to deliver certifications and management systems. And so that will, companies will find that as a, as, a, as a useful resource as they, they look to go through that certification journey. And I'm more than happy to, to address any specific questions from individuals or companies that want to specifically uh, talk about our journey or, or more generally around 45,001 should there be any. And I'd just like to thank you for your time.
Thanks, Wayne, and uh, thank you to all of you who took the time out to join us today. As with the previous session, we will be making a recording of the webinar and slides available for you to access if you keep an eye out for an email from us uh, next week, the respective links in there. If you do have a chance, please provide your feedback of today's session on the questionnaire that will be being displayed shortly. Thanks again for joining us, and don't forget to register for our upcoming webinars that are of interest. All details are available on the events page of the IQ website.